Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with a presentation for the A&P2 Blood Lab that you'll be working on independently the first week at Madison Area Technical College. There's um, five different topics for this lab, um, and you have a study guide for them on page 7 of your lab manual. These topics include looking at the composition of blood and then identifying different types of blood cells visually. And then the third is we'll look at some abnormal blood smears um, or um, abnormal blood composition. And then in number four, we'll look at uh, blood typing and the last thing we'll do is talk br very briefly about uh, blood clotting. So I'll start with this blood composition, and you can read most of this in your lab manual, but I wanted to point out that you'll need to know um, the red blood cell count for males and females. I usually say four to five and a half million cells per microliter for females, kind of round it. I'm not real picky on exactly 4.2 to 5.4. And then for males, maybe four and a half to six million um, cells per microliter. The key here is that males have more red blood cells than females per microliter of whole blood. And then for the hematocrit, you need to know normal hematocrit values and notice how they vary for males and females as well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then you need to know uh, normal values for hemoglobin. And you need to know the total white blood cell count, which is 5,000 to 10,000 white blood cells per microliter of blood, and you need to know a normal white uh, platelet count as well, which is 130,000 um, to 360,000 platelets per microliter. Now, as far as knowing the different types of white blood cells, and here they're listed, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, I don't want you to know the absolute numbers. I think those are kind of hard to memorize. But you should know the relative frequencies. So, for example, neutrophils make up the highest proportion of white blood cells, and basophils make up the lowest. And I have a little trick for remembering this frequency of the different types of white blood cells that I'll talk to you about in a minute. First, let's talk about the differences in hematocrit values. Remember that a hematocrit is the proportion of blood that is due to red blood cells, right? So um, normally the percent, it's reported in percent, and um, we learned earlier in lecture that red blood cells make up about 45% of blood volume, and plasma makes up the rest, 55. But notice since we have these um, ranges from a lab test done on males and females, that there is some variation, not just within the female group and within the male group, but between the two. Now, why do females have fewer or a lower percentage of red blood cells, or a lower hematocrit. Well, for one, they um, tend to experience blood loss during menstruation, and often that's more red blood cells clotted together than it is plasma. So they tend to lose red blood cells once a month through menstruation. Another factor is that um, there's a correlation between body fat and um, hematocrit. So the higher the percentage of body fat that a person has, 
typically the lower the hematocrit. This might have something to do with the amount of yellow bone marrow versus red bone marrow, but regardless of the reason why, women tend to have a higher percentage of body fat, um, all about hormonal control and preparing the body for pregnancy and things like that. So they tend to have a lower hematocrit. But probably the most important reason that males have higher levels of or higher numbers of red blood cells is due to the fact that they continuously make the hormone testosterone and that stimulates red blood cell production. Now um, here's my trick for remembering the percentage of the different white blood cell types or at least the frequency, the relative frequency, you know, most to least. So there's this saying, never let monkeys eat bananas. So N never matches neutrophils. So that's first, the most neutrophils. And then let L, that'd be lymphocytes, that'd be second. And then monkeys correlates to monocytes, which would be third. And eat, the E corresponds to eosinophils, that'd be fourth prevalent, and then the least prevalent, bananas, basophils, fifth. So you might want to remember that moniker. It helps me a lot. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Okay, now you should be able to answer questions one through five on page 10 of your lab manual. You can pause now and do it, um, or you can wait till the end of the presentation. That's okay. I will be posting an answer key on Blackboard to all the lab manual questions. But we're going to go on to the second uh, major topic of this lab, and that's identifying the different types of blood cells. So this picture is really a diagram, right? It's not actual cells in the microscope, but it's a good way to start learning. So red blood cells are um, smaller than white blood cells and they kind of have that divot in the middle. They're biconcave so that if you were to look at them from the side, you would see that that indentation is on both sides. And then um, platelets are really fragments of cells and they're the smallest formed element in blood. Now the white blood cells. So the white blood cells have nuclei. You won't see a nucleus in red blood cells and you can't make a nucleus out in a platelet because it's so small. But white blood cells, you can see prominent nuclei. Let's start with the neutrophils since they're the most prevalent. What you want to look for in a neutrophil is a lobed nucleus. Notice that this one has three lobes that are interconnected. Okay, but that's all one nucleus. It's just shaped funny, it's segmented. Now early in a neutrophil's life, it's not quite done with its segmentation. They call these bands, but this is also a neutrophil. I probably won't ask you a band, I'll probably ask you um, a segmented neutrophil on a test, because you know we're not experts after one semester, but so that's a neutrophil and notice the cytoplasm has some granules in it but they're faint and the cytoplasm looks pink now the um, next prevalent is lymphocytes and lymphocytes are pretty easy to pick out because their nuclei tend to take up the entire cell they have big nuclei and so there's not that much cytoplasm and they tend to stain blue. And then monocytes sometimes are hard to differentiate from lymphocytes, but even though they have a large nucleus, they have a lot more cytoplasm. And the nucleus always has this little indentation, making it look a little bit like a horseshoe. So you'll always look for that indentation. 
And then um, eosinophils are really easy to pick out because they're so bright due to all the present the presence of all the specific granules that look they end up looking kind of fluorescent. So an eosinophil kind of looks like a neutrophil in the sense that it has a segmented nucleus, but the cytoplasm is full of these bright staining um, specific granules. And then last but not least would be the basophils. And the basophils do have a nucleus. It's just that it's really hard to see the nucleus because the cytoplasm is so full of these dark blue staining specific granules that release histamine and, and heparin, and um, or histamine anyway. And so you can see all these tiny dark staining specific granules, and that's a basophil. So I made a list of what you should look for, the features to look for. Um, there's a question in your lab manual, you know, list these features, what you look for. The, eryth the erythrocytes don't have a nucleus, and they're concave in the middle. The, in the middle looks a little translucent because it's so thin. Neutrophils, you're looking for a nucleus that's segmented or lobed and you can't really see the granules very brightly. Eosinophils look similar. They have a lobed nucleus, but their granules are really super bright pink. And basophils, you can't really see the nucleus. It's obscured by how many dark staining granules exist, and they tend to be smaller too. Now, monocytes are usually the largest white blood cell um, and they sort of have a horse-shaped, horseshoe-shaped nucleus, but what that means is that there's like this little indentation in the nucleus. Lymphocytes vary in size, but um, what tends to be true is that the nucleus will take up almost the entire cytoplasm. And then a thrombocyte or a platelet are they're just really small. They're the smallest thing you'll see. Now there's one other type of cell that you might see in a blood smear under a microscope or a picture taken through a microscope, and those are reticulocytes. These reticulocytes are really immature red blood cells, and these red blood cells are developing over time, and during this development, they lose their organelles, right? They, the nucleus gets expelled, and all the other organelles do as well. However, sometimes as a red blood cell is maturing, it's released from the bone marrow kind of early before it's mature. So we see some red blood cells that are normal looking here in this picture on the left. They've already lost all their organelles. But in the case of this red blood cell, it's not quite translucent in the middle yet. It was probably released from the bone marrow early, and there's some fragments of organelles in there. I agree that picture is kind of hard to tell, but that one is a reticulocyte. It's a little larger, but it's really hard to tell. But I think you can see these reticulocytes pretty easy because they're the same size as the neighboring red blood cells, but they have these dark staining organelles that have not been expelled yet. So that's what a reticulocyte looks like. Okay, so <clears throat> this is, a, instead of looking at a diagram, I wanted to show you here in this presentation an actual um, photograph of the blood cells taken through a microscope. So you can see the red blood cells they're kind of, they look see-through in the middle just because they're so thin. And look at how tiny, number two, the platelets are here. They're really small. So number one is a neutrophil, and so is number five. I probably would ask you on a test number five because it's more obvious. And then Number four, that's a lymphocyte. Notice the nucleus takes up, it's very round, and it takes up almost the entire cytoplasm. Now, if we compare 
number five with number three, the neutrophil with this cell number three, white blood cell number three. Look at the cytoplasm. There's all these pink, bright staining um, granules. So that's an eosinophil. And then number six is the monocyte. It's got this nucleus that's kind of got a divot in it. And then number eight, that's a basophil. So I hope that helps you. Now you should be able to answer questions um, in your lab manual, one through seven on pages 12 through 14. And again, I will post an answer key for those questions. Now let's look at some abnormal blood smears. And what our aim is, um, is to be able, our goal is to be able to recognize abnormal erythrocytes, which we see in sickle cell anemia and in iron deficiency anemia. And then we also want to look at abnormal smears that show high and low leukocyte counts. We're just going to look at one example, and that's leukemia, which has very high um, white blood cell counts, very high. We also want to look at um, hematocrit values that are abnormal and be able to say that they're normal or abnormal, high or low. And we will see um, examples of high hematocrits with the following conditions. There's a disease called polycythemia vera in which the um, bone marrow reproduces very high numbers of red blood cells. And then in dehydration, um, there's a higher proportion of red blood cells versus plasma. And then in lung disease, often red blood cell production goes up to try to compensate for the lack of oxygen coming from the lungs. So all of these conditions will produce high hematocrits. And then we're going to look at low hematocrit values, and we'll see um, low hematocrit in certain types of anemia. So let's start with anemia. The definition of anemia is the reduced ability of blood to reduced ability to carry oxygen. So anything that causes the blood not to be able to carry oxygen adequately could be called anemia. That doesn't mean lung disease. This would be a characteristic of blood. So some causes might include just that there's lower numbers of red blood cells so not able to carry as much oxygen or the red blood cells are abnormal for some reason their shape is wrong the chemicals inside the molecules inside are abnormal and so the red blood cells can't carry oxygen that might be due to abnormal hemoglobin which we know is what really binds to the oxygen another cause could be iron deficiency which does relate to hemoglobin because if you remember the heme group in hemoglobin has iron in it which actually facilitates the binding of oxygen so there's a lot of different causes to anemia anything that reduces the ability of the blood to carry oxygen is anemia we're going to look at two specific examples let's look at sickle cell anemia first now in this case there's a reduced ability to carry oxygen. The blood has that reduced ability. And um, this is due to certain cells, red blood cells, becoming irregularly shaped here. They're sickle shaped. Um, and these sickle shaped cells cannot bind oxygen as well. And they're actually targeted for destruction as well. They're going to get caught in the spleen and hemolysis will occur and they'll be destroyed. So we usually see a, a low hematocrit in sickle cell anemia, at least initially. 
And the reason these cells become sickle shaped is because the hemoglobin is abnormal. Hemoglobin proteins, the globin part, um, it's, they're chains of amino acids, and this abnormal hemoglobin is just due to one amino acid being wrong, just one. So there's a genetic mutation that makes the hemoglobin protein the wrong sequence of amino acids, and so it's the wrong shape. And if the hemoglobin is the wrong shape, it becomes stiff, kind of spiky, and it causes this cell to form an abnormal shape or the sickle shape. And those cells are more fragile. So I think you can definitely see that this is an example of sickle cell anemia because the sickle cells are so obvious right there. There's another one here. Um, I want to ask you, this is another picture I have of sickle cell anemia, and the, there's only one I can see here. This is a sickle cell right there. But I wanted to ask you, since it's a good picture here, uh, what types of cells are these, right? So the first one up here looks like a lymphocyte to me. But the one in the middle... circle it. This looks like a reticulocyte. It's not agreeing with me here. Hold on a second. There we go. This looks like a reticulocyte to me. It's about the same size as a red blood cell and the nucleus is still intact. And then over here we have a neutrophil, which doesn't look very big, does it? Okay, let's look at the difference between sickle cell anemia and iron deficiency anemia. In iron deficiency anemia, you might see um, lots of red blood cells and not necessarily have a low hematocrit. Okay, the hematocrit could be normal. It could even be higher to, for compensation. But what the problem is, is that the hemoglobin can't bind oxygen due to the fact that there's inadequate iron in the diet. Okay, And so these cells don't have normal heme. They don't look dark staining. They're very pale. So that's iron deficiency anemia. OK, let's look at some abnormal uh, blood smears that relate to abnormal numbers of leukocytes. Okay, So first, there's two options here. We could either have a high number of white blood cells or a low number of white blood cells. The term for high number is leukocytosis. And some causes of having lots of extra red blood cells would be maybe infection and cancer, or known as leukemia when it's a white blood cell cancer. The term for low numbers of white blood cells is leukopenia. Sometimes people use leukocytopenia, but they mean the same thing. And some examples that of diseases or disorders that cause low numbers of white blood cells would be certain autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, maybe due to bone marrow damage, which usually isn't genetic, it's usually, it can be, but it could be caused by radiation or chemotherapy, right? Um, of course, there can be bone marrow disease as well. And infections, there are certain infections that actually decrease the number of white blood cells. There's certain viruses that do that and certain bacteria that do that. We don't have to memorize them, though. OK, so here's an example. The only one you have to be able to recognize is leukemia. OK, so in normal blood, this, this smear, I don't know how normal it really is, because I'm seeing quite a few white blood cells, right? I'm seeing compared to erythrocytes. This picture has actually. Um, <laughs> You know, it skews, it skews your perception. 
of how many white blood cells you would see under the microscope. I mean, somebody had to scan quite a bit to find these this many white blood cells grouped together, okay? But nonetheless, in a normal blood smear, you shouldn't see very many white blood cells in one field of view. But in leukemia, look at how many you see. I mean, you just see the, the white blood cells completely overtake the number of red blood cells, particularly in this picture on the right. Okay, So obviously that's a problem if the bone marrow is putting out more white blood cells than red blood cells, um, you will have an oxygen carrying deficiency for sure. So you just have to be able to recognize leukemia, that's all. Okay, now let's look at um, abnormal hematocrit values. And let's recall the definition of a hematocrit. It's the proportion of whole blood that's due to red blood cells. So in the lecture, we said that's 45%. And plasma then would be 55%. And in lab, um, when we do meet um, for lab, you'll have a chance to measure hematocrits, but I'm going to give you an introduction here on how you'll measure it. We won't be using real blood. We're going to use these capillary tubes that are shown um, here in the pictures. Um, these capillary tubes have been filled with a solution that mimics uh, red blood cells. So you can see down here, that'd be red blood cells. And then there's clear fluid above to represent the plasma. So what we do normally is you collect whole blood, you spin it down in a centrifuge, and the red blood cells um, sink down to the bottom of whatever the device is you've centrifuged. In this case, it's a capillary tube. And so then we have two devices that um, measure the percentage of the blood due to red blood cells. So um, I like to use these cards, but you can use this circular device too, but I'm going to show you this one. You have a picture of this in your lab manual. So 100% goes on a scale like this from top at the top and then zeros down at the bottom. And what you have to do is line up your capillary tube so the bottom of the blood is at zero and the top is at 100. If you had less in here, for some reason, let's just say you had less blood in here, so the plasma only went up to that, you'd have to move your capillary tube left until that top part of the blood was actually um, at 100%. So we just use the card and slide the capillary tube over. And then we um, look at where is the top of the red blood cell mark? You know, what percentage is that? And if you look, if you trace over and follow the line, it's about 20%, I think, is what I'm reading. That's pretty small. Okay, so these cards, I think, are easier to use than this device. And this, the device on the left, you put the capillary tube in a, a little, I guess we'll call it a tray, and you spin the capillary tube in a circle until the top of the plasma is exactly at the 100 mark here and the bottom is at the zero, and then you read this. The reason I have a hard time with the device on the left is that the numbers are so small, and I'm getting old and I can't see them. So, but we'll, we'll do it together. <clears throat> so just to talk about um, hematocrits a little bit, um, here are some examples from a picture of different hematocrits, right? So if you look at all these four samples and the values that I've already calculated for you. So like this one is, number one is 45%, number two is 
supposedly at 30. Number three is all the way up at 70. And number four is at 70, and this is the scale, 70 here. If you look at these, okay, you want to be able to say which one is normal. So which sample is normal? That would be number one, right? Which sample has a low hematocrit? Well, that would be number two, right? 30%. And then there's two samples that are high, and those are three and four, sample three and four. And of course, the value is 40%. I'm sorry, 70%. 70%. I don't know what I'm saying 40% for. Okay, so let's look at this question number four. With re the red blood cell kind of at the same eye level here between one and four. I mean, they look like the same, right? If you just look at the red blood cells. Why do we have two different numbers? Number one, hematocrit is 45. Number four is 70. Well, it's because look at how far the plasma goes. That, that's your 100% mark. So in number four, the volume of blood due to red blood cells is much higher, 70%. So now let's compare, in question five here, let's compare samples three and four. What why are they both 70% even though the plasmas are, you know, at different values? What might cause number three and what might cause number four is what I'm looking at for. So number four seems pretty obvious to me. If you have less plasma, then that's probably due to dehydration, right? So number four would be due to dehydration. Number three you just have a lot of extra red blood cells. And there's a lot of reasons that the body would produce extra red blood cells. Lung disease, and then the bone marrow disorder called polycythemia vera. And so, um, you know, some bone marrow disorder. So an increased, you actually have increased red blood cell counts. Okay, you should now be able to at least answer questions 13 and 14 on page number 17 in your lab manual. Feel free to pause now and do it or wait till the end of the presentation and I will post an answer key. Okay, now we're going to look at blood typing. And I'm sure you've heard about blood types, type A, type B, type O. Um, and the concept of transfusing blood and making sure that blood types match. Most of us have at least vaguely heard of this. We want to know what blood type is based on and how you match donor and recipient blood. That's what we want to learn about. So blood type is based on the type of antigens present on the surface of erythrocytes. Now, in this case, the term antigen doesn't mean anything bad. It just means a surface, a cell surface molecule. It's supposed to be there, okay? So red blood cells have molecules on the surface. And there's two groups of these antigens that are used to type blood routinely. One group is called the ABO group. So they'll look at red blood cells and try to determine um, for a sample of blood if the A, B, or O type is um, appropriate. And then the other group is the R fa RH factor. So if we look at the ABO blood group, there's two, there's two antigens in this group. A antigens, which have colored purple, and B antigens, which have colored green. So the red blood cell on the left 
up here has A antigens and the red blood cell on the right has B antigens. It is true that a red blood cell can have both. Okay. But we'll get back to that in a second. For the Rh factor, you just look at the presence of one antigen. It's called Rh factor. And if it's there, then it's there. If it's not, it's absent. And that's the, that's the antigen right there, the Rh factor. Let's just concentrate first on ABO blood groups or types. The A and B antigens are, are glycolipids, and they're made by an enzyme that's encoded on a gene, chromosome 9. Don't worry about memorizing that. But based on the presence or absence of these antigens in somebody's red blood cells, we could have four different blood types just based on these A and B antigens. If somebody's red blood cells don't have either, we call them type O. If somebody's red blood cells have just the A antigens, they're called type A blood. And if somebody's blood has just the B antigens, they're called type B blood. But if somebody's got both the A antigens and the B antigens, then we give them the designation of type AB blood. So these are the four different types of blood or blood types based on just the A and B antigens, whether or not they're there or absent. Now let's look at the RH factor. Okay, so as I mentioned before, either somebody's red blood cells have RH or they don't. Okay. So the Rh factor is a protein, okay? And there's a lot of different Rh factors. So we're just going to deal with this one. It's the one that's used the most often. It doesn't matter, just Rh factor. And if somebody does have Rh, we call them Rh positive. And usually that's, that's sort of um, abbreviated, and we just say positive. We don't even use the Rh. We just say positive. If somebody doesn't have Rh factor on their red blood cells, then they're negative. We call them Rh negative, and it's usually abbreviated to just negative. So if we combine these two different antigen groups, the ABO group and the Rh factor, we come up with eight different possible blood types. So somebody could have A antigens and the Rh factor, and then they would be called A positive. But if they didn't have the Rh factor, but they do have the A antigens, then they're called A negative. <coughs> the same would be true for the B antigens. If somebody has both B and Rh, they're called B for the B and positive for the Rh. If they don't have the Rh factor, but they still have the B antigens, we say they are B negative. So I just want to point out here that the positive and negative notation doesn't have anything to do with the A and the B. It's only due to the presence or absence of Rh factor only. That's all, just Rh factor. So if somebody has all three different types of antigens, the A antigen, the B antigen, and the Rh factor, we call them AB and positive for the Rh factor. If someone doesn't have any of those antigens, no A, no B, and no Rh factor, we call them type O, for the AB absence, and negative for the absence of the RH factor. It's a little bit confusing with that positive and negative business. So when we type blood, we look for the presence of those antigens. And we do it by applying antibodies 
that specifically bind to the different types of antigens. So for example, antibody A, which I've drawn purple here because then it matches the purple A antigen, the antibody A binds to antigen A. It won't bind to any other antigen. Antibody B only binds to the antigen B. And antibody RH binds only to RH factor. So we take three different samples of blood. Here's one from somebody. I mean, it's like the same person, but. Okay, there's, and we apply antibody A to one, antibody B to another, and antibody RH to the last. And what we look for is if there is binding. And the binding event is called agglutination. So we're looking for an agglutination reaction, which is a clumping of red blood cells. So this is what happens if ant the antibody you applied recognizes an antigen on the red blood cell, all the red blood cells get clumped up together. And you'll see a difference in the appearance of the blood. You'll see this clumping. And so you can say, yes, that antigen is present according to whatever antibody. So in lab, if we were meeting this week, we would use these wells and we would put blood, the blood sample, it's not real blood, in each of these three wells. One, two, and three. And then we would apply antibodies according to how um, each well is labeled. A, antibody A goes there, antibody B goes there, and antibody RH goes there. And after we apply the antibodies, we mix it up with a toothpick, wait a little bit for agglutination to happen, because sometimes it takes a while, and then we have to look at the samples. And agglutination has occurred in this picture in well A and in RH. Just notice that in those two blood samples, there's it's the blood isn't as transparent anymore. In B here, the blood is still clear. There's no clumping that occurred. So what this means is the antibody A found antigens in the red, on the red blood cells. So this person has A antigens for sure. And this person must have RH factor because we see clumping in the RH well. So there's also RH factor on the red blood cells. And the blood type then, for somebody that has both of those, is A positive. So this person has A positive blood. Now, I know we're not meeting in person, and we may or may not have time to do this in class. Um, so there's um, a really nice um, online activity where you get to practice doing this. I know it's all animated, but um, please go to that link, and it'll have you put blood into wells, put antibodies into wells, look for agglutination, and then determine um, what the blood type is. And when you do this animated exercise, you can enter your data on page 21 um, for the people listed there in number eight, Mr. Smith, Ms. Jones, Mr. Green, Ms. Brown. And um, we'll go over the answers in class um, after we do the heart anatomy next week. So I would really recommend you doing the blood typing activity from that link. Then you should be able to answer questions one through nine in your lab manual.
Now let's talk about blood type compatibilities. Giving blood from a donor into another person, a recipient. And as you know, whole blood, if we were to give whole blood, take whole blood out of a person, you know, there's red blood cells and that's where the antigens are on the red blood cells. But the antibodies are in the plasma. So what we typically do instead of giving whole blood is we give packed red blood cells. So the plasma and the antibodies are filtered off. So <clears throat> let's talk about blood types and what antibodies are present in someone's blood. So antibodies are always specific for a certain antigen. And in blood types, any antigen that's foreign to somebody, they will have antibodies for foreign substances in their plasma. So I'm not saying this very well, but let's talk about an example and then it'll make sense. If somebody has type A positive blood, then that means that they have on their red blood cells little A's and little RH's. I know they're not really letters, but we're going to pretend that. So A, I have to wait, okay, and RH. But in their plasma, what would be foreign to them? would be type B antigens, that would be foreign. So in their plasma, they have antibodies against B. So they would have antibodies against B. So let's just look at this in a little bit more detail see if it makes sense to you, or I guess a little bit more summary. Okay, so let's take somebody who has type B blood. Let's start there, type B blood. Somebody who has type B blood, look at the column that is labeled B here, okay? And on their red blood cells, they have little Bs, supposedly, little B antigens. And in their plasma, they have antibodies against A antigens. Okay, this is just for the ABO stuff. If somebody has type AB blood, then neither A nor B is foreign to them. So they're not going to have any antibodies, or at least not against A and not against B. Somebody who has type O blood doesn't have A or B antigens present. So both are foreign to them, and they will have antibodies against A and against B. Now, since we give packed red blood cells to a recipient, we don't have to worry about what about the antibodies from the donor. For the donor, all we have to look at is what is on their red blood cells. But we do have to consider the recipient's antibodies. So we have to look at what kind of antibodies are present in the recipient to make sure that the typing is, you know, um, compatible. So for example, somebody, a recipient, let's say we have a recipient who is type O, We'll say the recipient is typo right here, typo. This is the recipient. So the recipient has antibodies to both A and B. It would be very bad to give them A, type A red blood cells or type B red blood cells because the antibodies would bind the red blood cells, they would clump up and they would break down and be destroyed through hemolysis.
and then there, you would have reduced ability to carry oxygen. So basically, it would do no good. You would you would donate the red blood cells, but the recipient, the antibodies, would attack the red blood cells, and it just wouldn't do any good. Okay. Um, so to prevent transfusion reactions, we try to match. Sorry, slow here. We try to um, match packed red blood cell types to what is in the recipient's um, plasma, as far as antibodies go. So let's talk about uh, one example here. We've got a recipient who is A negative. And so what that means is on their red blood cells, all they have are A antigens. This is the recipient who needs a transfusion, needs blood, doesn't have enough red blood cells. But the ones they do have have A antigens on them. In their plasma are antibodies against foreign antigens. So there are B antibodies and there are Rh antibodies. Therefore, you wouldn't want to give any blood that have a red blood cells that have Bs on them or Rh factor on them. So let's look at the possibility of using donor one blood. We're just going to give the packed red blood cells. So all you have to do is look at what is on the red blood cells. The plasma will be filtered off. So notice that there's a B antigen on donor one blood. That's a problem because the B antibody will destroy that blood. So that's not going to work. Now donor two blood, let's look at it for just a second, this possibility. These red blood cells, we're just going to give the packed red blood cells, have A antigens, which is good and RH antigen, which is bad. Because remember, the recipient has RH antibodies. So donor 2 blood won't work either. So we have to get another donor. We have to find another donor. Now I will say that um, when considering transfusions, the universal donor is type O negative blood. So that would be type O blood with no A's, no B's, and the negative meaning no RH factor. So you can give O negative to anyone. And also there's a universal recipient that can receive anything, and that would be the type AB positive blood. So if somebody is AB positive, they don't have antigens against A, I mean antibodies against A, antibodies against B, or antibodies against RH, so you could give them anything. And we'll talk about that in class as well as lecture. So now you should be able to answer question 10 on page 22, and I will post an answer key as well. And the last topic for this lab has to do with coagulation. And the only reason I'm bringing it up in this lab is to make sure that you understand that that agglutination reaction that we have been looking at to type blood, agglutination, where antibodies are linking up red blood cells and they all clump up together, that is not the same thing as a blood clot. A blood clot, shown in this picture, is formed by a very controlled process called coagulation. And during coagulation, a protein forms called fibrin. And when this fibrin forms, red blood cells get trapped in it because it's kind of sticky. So there's no antibodies involved here or the presence of antigens. It's this meshwork of fibrin and trapped platelets
trapped white blood cells and trapped red blood cells. So coagulation and agglutination, they are not the same thing. Okay, just wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay, now you can answer questions on page 23 for coagulation. Um, and I hope what I've given you in this presentation helps you with doing this lab on your own. And um, we'll talk about it in after we do heart anatomy when we meet together. Thank you.